Live from Quito, Ecuador, I'm Sony Gray and this is from the South, the Midday News Brief from Telesio English. And we start this new edition right now. A high-level donor conference is underway at the United Nations in New York to raise much-needed funds for the Caribbean community countries who were ravaged by hurricanes earlier on in the season. The islands affected need hundreds of millions of dollars to rebuild, even though they've barely contributed to the climate change which most scientists blame for the increasingly severe weather events. The pledging conference was called for by CARICOM and it's meant to help the islands get the funds they so desperately need for their recovery. Challenge for his country since that fateful day in September when Barbuda was decimated. He said the cost of rebuilding is 223 million US dollars. That is 100% of his country's annual earnings, which would leave no funds available for basic public expenditure such as salaries. The areas of priority are the social sectors, assistance to help us to rebuild the loan hospital to build at least one additional school facility, uh, to restore public buildings, and perhaps most importantly, to rebuild approximately 400 homes, and at the same time, to ensure that we use this opportunity to transform Barbuda into a totally green, climate resilient, and organic Barbuda. Brown's Dominican con counterpart, Roosevelt Skerritt, also spoke of rebuilding green, climate-resilient infrastructure on his island. Skerritt said the international estimates of the cost of rebuilding are inaccurate and detailed the full extent of the damage. The effect of this damage and loss is greater than this number suggests because Maria spared no part of the island from total destruction. There are no areas of stability or refuge from which we can support and supply other parts. The entire power grid was down and remains 97%. So, water and sanitation pipes were broken. We lost nearly 100% of crops. Murray damaged 90% 90, 90 of our homes. She severely compromised the road and bridge network. Despite the solidarity many have shown, the spread of the damage does not permit early bounce back. The Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis spoke of cooperation and says his country will do what it can to help despite their own challenges. St. Kitts and Nevis stands today in solidarity with all countries impacted by hurricanes. We are a proud and resilient people. We have been helping ourselves and where we can we have been helping our neighbors but the task of reconstruction and rebuilding is beyond our own limited resources. We appreciate the support which the donor community has offered and will up even more today. Our correspondent Karina Cartagena is at the UN and she sent this report. Hello, greetings from New York. There is an expectation in the Caribbean about this high-level meeting in the United Nations. Its uh, purpose is to ask for international help for the Caribbean countries devastated by the hurricane Irma and Mary in the last months. Representatives of the Caribbean countries have told the international community that uh, climate change is not a question for the people of the Caribbean because they live this reality daily. The Secretary General of CARICOM said that hurricanes Mary and Irma made a huge devastation and thousands of people have been affected. They don't have a house to live, schools, hospitals and a place to work. In this meeting, the Secretary General of the United Nations said we must commit to the rebuilding effort. Funding and technical assistance are needed to help the affected countries to get back on their feet. 
He also said that housing, telecommunications, water and sanitation, healthcare services and education facilities are needed. According to a preliminary evaluation by CELAC, hurricane season in the Caribbean caused more than $2.2 billion in losses. Back to you. That report from Karina Cartagena. We go now to Peter Wickham, who is a political scientist based in Barbados, but he works throughout the region. He's in Paris at the moment, but we join him live via Skype to discuss the UN CARICOM conference. Hello, Peter. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, we just listened to several Caribbean leaders detail the high cost of recovery. How successful do you think this conference will be for the Caribbean? Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm really not sure. Right now, I'm a bit concerned about the fact that the international community has a lot on its plate and um, the extent to which this is a priority, we're not really sure. Um, the United States is one of our key donors, or has been over the years, but they also have their challenges with similar problems in uh, Puerto Rico uh, and in the West Virgin Islands and so on. So we appreciate that it is the success of the conference is going to be heavily dependent on the extent to which we can take the attention of the world away from their own uh, issues and also to, to look at ours. But nonetheless, it's something that we have to do. And just to bring it back to the region, are you happy with CARICOM's response to this new challenge that they have to face, these natural disasters? Yeah, well, I think that we're doing, uh, CARICOM is doing as much as it can. And a donor conference makes a lot of sense for a couple of reasons. Even if countries are not in a position to give assistance, I think that it is an important step that we have to follow uh, to make the world aware of the case and also to help to build our own case when we're arguing for something like that relief. Uh, when we're arguing for the legitimacy of the citizenship by investment program, which has actually been one of the key uh, sources of revenue for several of these countries, both Dominica and Antigua Barbuda over the last few years. So I think it's an important step and, and uh, it's a necessary step. And, you know, really, I don't know that we have many options. I think CARICOM is doing as much as it can do. And this is probably, under the circumstances, one of the best things that it can do. Which kind of puts us in a bit of a, a quandary because um, you're a little concerned that the international community is a little too overwhelmed. So they're probably not going to step up to the plate. And then CARICOM is kind of, I guess, overwhelmed us as well. So what does this really bode for the Caribbean in terms of our ability to survive situations like these? Because the fact is that climate, climate change is our new reality and we're going to have to expect, possibly even next year, to have to deal with hurricanes of these natures again. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm looking at a long-term narrative, looking at a long-term narrative for all of this. And I mean, this is all part of the development problem. Even before this started, we had a challenge in terms of development for the Caribbean, a challenge which was partially solved by citizenship, by investment. These programs have deemed to be illegitimate or have been deemed to be illegitimate by many countries and their concerns about it. So the question is, where do we turn? Tourism is seen as a logical developmental option. Uh, Dominica has actually been trying to develop green tourism. And you can see from the scenes on the screen that Dominica now cannot look at tourism seriously for quite some time. So I think it's important then for us to have this conversation about what is the alternative development narrative that we in the Caribbean can pursue. Uh, and even in a situation where countries are are not in a position to say we'll donate 30 or 40 million dollars in aid uh, they may be able to say well let's look at debt relief and i think early on the earlier uh, the issue of debt relief was put on the table and i think that's an important thing that um, not necessarily donors but other countries can consider whether this is not a good time to help relieve us of some of the debt that we have to carry because both antigua dominica and other countries in the caribbean that are dealing with hurricane relief are also saddled with tremendous debt and then, of course, there is the Citizenship by Investment Program. If it is that we are pushing this as an alternative to the tourism, which we can't do, uh, to the agriculture, which has not been successful, um, and to all of the other development options that we have tried, maybe this is the way that CARICOM is communicating to the outside world that, look, we, we need to be given the opportunity to try something else, which uh, we have been doing with CIB, uh, and perhaps you can participate with us on that. Now, that discussion starts later. I think that this discussion is where we say, okay, this is the problem that we have. Uh, this is the, the, the narrative that we want to begin to have a dialogue about. And then later we can start to put alternative options on the table as a, as a region. 
Thank you so much. We've been talking to Peter Wickham. He is a political scientist based in Barbados, and we were just talking about the CARICOM donor conference that is currently taking place at the United Nations in New York. Other news now, the Whitefish Energy Firm, which won and then lost a controversial contract to restore power in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, is halting work because of a payment issue. The energy utility, which had only two permanent employees and is linked to donors to the Trump campaign, was meant to continue repair work until the end of this month. It said that payments have been delayed from PREPA, Puerto Rico's bankrupt power authority. However, PREPA said they had to stop payments after receiving a complaint from a subcontractor to Whitefish. The Trump administration has announced an end to the temporary protected status for more than 50,000 Haitians living in the United States. The U.S. government will scrap the humanitarian program that allowed 59,000 Haitians to live and work in the United States after the 2010 devastating earthquake. Haitians are now expected to leave the U.S. by July 2019 or face deportation. The announcement comes after a similar step was taken against 5,000 Nicaraguans early this month. And we have more news in a minute, so stay with us. President of Sitgo, the U.S. subsidiary of Venezuela's state-owned oil company, has been arrested in Caracas, along with five other directors of the company on charges of corruption. Jose Angel Pereira and the other executives are accused of negotiating with two equity funds to refinance $4 billion of the country's debt, the to the detriment of the Venezuelan interest. The funds include Involved include Apollo Global Management LLC, one of the biggest and most aggressive of the so-called vulture funds that trade in distressed debt. Venezuela students have been marching through Caracas to mark Student Day. The marches from a variety of public universities set off from the Plaza Venezuela to the Miraflores Presidential Palace. The day marks the 60th anniversary of a student strike in 1957, which began the movement to bring down the dictatorship of Marcos Perez Jimenez. Venezuela's economic minister, Simon Zipper, met his Turkish counterpart, Nihad Zibaksay, during an official visit to Ankara, Turkey, to advance economic cooperation. The meeting was based on the Economic and Commercial Cooperation Agreement, signed last October, after the official visit of President Nicolas Maduro to Turkey. The ministers agreed to hold the first Economic Commission meeting in January 2018, with the objective of cooperating in areas such as agriculture, energy, health, industry, science, and technology. The Gas Exporting Countries Forum has held its fourth annual event in Bolivia, with the participation of the 10 most important oil companies in the world. The stability of the gas market and improvement on technology were discussed at the summit. Our correspondent in Bolivia, Freddy Morales, has more information. This week, Bolivia will be in the spotlight. The fourth forum of gas exporting countries began today here in Santa Cruz. On the inauguration ceremony, President Evo Morales shared the Bolivian experience of nationalizing natural resources, which for decades were in the hands of transnational oil companies. This historic decision represents an economic boost for Bolivia. The international reserves are increased from 2 billion to 15 billion. Investments expanded from 600 million to 7 billion annually. These economic resources have been used to improve and build new gas production plants that will help to assist social programs. The forum will end on Friday with the President's meeting, where new agreements and measures will be discussed. That's all the information I have so far. We go back to the studio. We thank Freddy Morales for that report. Negotiations to update NAFTA continue in Mexico as the United States' tough demands could sink the 1994 trade agreement. 
Meanwhile, Canada's officials have said that they have common interests with the hosting nation on several issues. Mexico and Canada have said that some of the U.S. proposals could damage the agreement and that their team has no willingness to debate on the counter-proposal presented by Mexico. The deadline to sign the deal expires in March 2018. Honduras prepares for general elections under heavy military security as authorities started distributing election material around the country ahead of Sunday's general elections. Juan Orlando Fernandez, who is seeking a second consecutive term in office, held his closing rally in the capital and talked about security improvements in the country. The current president is pushing for re-election after the Supreme Court overturned the ban to do so. Voters will also elect a new Congress on November 26th. Congress is meeting in Colombia for a final debate before the transitional justice law under the country's peace deal is approved. Our correspondent in Bogota, Lorena Hoyos, has the details. The Congress is meeting to discuss Colombia's transitional justice law under the country's peace deal, the last debate before the law is approved. Nevertheless, many groups are worried about the changes made to the transitional law that could leave some crimes unpunished. Other concerns touch on those who are not required to be bound by this new transitional justice system, leaving many victims without justice and truth. This benefits third parties and those who were public officials but were not part of any enforcement group. In the afternoon, people are gathering at Plaza de Bolívar to deliver a letter to congressmen and to ask them to reverse the decision to prevent human rights defenders to be part of this new transitional justice system. They are also protesting to defend the peace agreement as well as asking Congress to respect the deals achieved by the Colombian state and the FARC in Havana. Odebrecht's former director allegedly confessed to the Peruvian prosecutor that he financed the campaign of President Pedro Pablo Kuczynski and that the current president also contacted him directly. This version matches with previous announces from Anti-Corruption Office and Peruvian, the Peruvian Congress. In his testimony in front of the Peruvian prosecutor, Marcelo Odebrecht allegedly confirmed that he financed principal candidates for Peru's presidency, among them Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, that information was revealed by the website Idol Reporteros. Kaczynski denied the accusations. This claimed version is false, as I wrote on my Twitter account. I haven't received any contribution or support from that company on either of my two electoral campaigns. However, this journalistic revelation matched with a statement from anti-corruption attorney Catherine Ampuero. Earlier this year, she found records of deposits made to Kaczynski and to companies linked to him between 2007, 2008, and in 2015. Cruz president allegedly received over $250,000 from an offshore account in the Grand Cayman Islands, a tax haven, and nobody knows why. That happened during the election campaign, and there's also money transfers from Odebrecht Latin Invest Company to companies linked to the Peruvian president via his partner, Sepulveda. Reportedly, Odebrecht also declared that he hired Krasinski as a consultant, information that Congressman Manuel Demet published back in 2009 in his book The Lobby Republic, where he pointed out that Krasinski also allowed big profits for the construction company with projects like the Interoceanic Highway and Olmos's irrigation project. He was part of Odebrecht's hoax. He's a financial collaborator in Odebrecht's actions and projects. That is his responsibility. If he's responsible, he must be replaced because we can't have as president somebody that participated in this kind of corruption. Congressman Demet, among other politicians, demanded that the prosecutor should accelerate the investigation against Kaczynski, which has been stuck in limbo for months. With better weather, the search resumes for the missing Argentinian submarine. The rescue operation for the missing Argentine Navy submarine, Arasan 1, has been picked up again after fierce weather affected the search on Tuesday. More than a dozen boats and planes from Argentina, the United States, Britain, Chile and Brazil have joined the search. The Navy has now confirmed, however, that the satellite signals received earlier did not come from the submarine. Communication satellite companies analyze a spectrum of more than 400 satellite call signals and at last ascertained that the seven call signals were not from Ara San Juan. 
is really a wide spectrum, large-scale analysis with more than one communication satellite company involved. Because only by checking all the signals from various kinds of boats, including fishing boats and other boats, using communication satellite, could the result be determined. So it will take more time. The former members of the Argentine Army Intelligence will be tried for crimes against humanity during the last military dictatorship. The trial group together cases from torture centers in Cordoba, where the atrocities took place. More information from our correspondent, Agado Esteban. There are a lot of expectations on what's going to happen in Cordoba, involving the eight trials for crimes against humanity in the Argentinian province. In this case, Federal Oral Court No. 1 will take the trial considering two clandestine centers. The first, the Campo de la Rivera's clandestine center, and then also a police department in the province of Cordoba, where there are more than 60 cases of kidnapping, torture, repression, and forced disappearance. Furthermore, there are 22 former military officials who are going to be tried for crimes committed during the military dictatorship between 1975 and 1978. One of the most important actors, emblematic of repression in Argentina, Luciano Benjamin Menendez, a former Argentine general and commander of the Third Army Corps in Cordoba during those years. He represents one of many dictatorial repressors who will be on trial in Cordoba. So there's a lot of expectations on what's happening in the next hours here in Argentina. With that, we come back to you. Preparations for the Cuban municipal elections continue to vote for representatives to the municipal assembly. On November 26, more than 8 million Cubans will vote to elect the representatives of 12,500 regional voting districts for two years and a half term. The National Electoral Commission has activated more than 24,000 electoral colleges and more than 200,000 authorities that will work during the election process. Thousands of people marched in the city, city of Sao Paulo to commemorate Black Consciousness Day. The celebration was promoted by the government of Lula de Silva back in 2003 and honors the Quilombo leader, Zumba dos Palmares. It is estimated that over 4,008,000 African slaves enter Brazil, eight times more than the number of European settlers until 1850. Until today, Afro-descendants still march for their lives. They bluntly kill black people. Thousands of black people are killed every day by the police, who should defend us, but they are the ones attacking us. Of the nearly 700,000 people in prison in Brazil, 60% are black. Also, the homicides committed by the Sao Paulo police are three times more than against whites. The little advances we made were taken away by these governments. Our people have been killed by bullets from the state. And when we go to a free clinic, there are no doctors. Also, the education is very poor. Until 2001, only 10% of the black population had access to universities. The number tripled with the scholarship system implemented during the governments of Lula da Silva and Dilma Rousseff. But today, still 18% of Afro-Brazilians are still without any access to education. Political representation for black people is only 3% in a country where we are 55% of the population. That means that we are kept aside from all political issues. According to Oxfam, black people only receive 75% of the salary of whites with the same education level. This is the day of consciousness that 517 years ago we suffered the same as we do today in this country. Now we have to remain in the struggle to end racism and the genocide against black men, black women and black children in this country. In a country where the police kill a black every 23 minutes, the Black Consciousness Day denounced an increasing genocide that won't stop. And we'll be back very soon to stay with us.
The Speaker of Zimbabwe's Parliament has announced that R President Robert Mugabe has now resigned as President after 37 years in power. The official letter of resignation was submitted just as the Parliament began impeachment proceedings against him. The 93-year-old leader who had refused to step down. Many celebrated in the streets. Recently reinstated Vice President Emnon Gagwa is expected to take over within 48 hours. The Honorable Jacob Mundenda, notice of resignation. Now let's take a look at some of the other stories making headlines around the world. Russian President no, Vladimir like Putin has hosted CUN President Bashar al-Assad in Sochi for talks about how to move forward with a political solution to the Syrian conflict. Putin suggested the military campaign was coming to an end. He is scheduled to meet with leaders from Iran and Turkey in the coming days. There was anger and desperation at a distribution center in Bangladesh as thousands of Rohingya refugees queued for food and medicine for their families. The asylum seekers survive on handouts coordinated by the government and various UN agencies and NGOs. The refugees have to wait for hours to receive the services. I've been waiting here since the early morning and I've only just got the medicine. It's been more than four hours. They've only given me one kind of medicine. I'm facing many difficulties because of the disease in my legs. I've been having these problems for two months. I can't sleep and I can't eat properly. As I have diabetes, I can eat everything. I'm poor so I can't buy proper things to eat. They won't refer me anywhere else. FIFA's ethics watchdog has banned three former soccer officials for life as part of the efforts to address widespread corruption in the sport. The latest officials to be hit by the bans are Richard Lai of Guam, Julio Rocha of Nicaragua and Rafael Esquivel of Venezuela. All three men have pleaded guilty in the United States to separate federal charges ranging from wire fraud to racketeering and money laundering. The Havana Lou Latin American Cinema International Film Festival is coming back with more than 400 movies. This year, festival organizers received more than 1,700 films, an indication of the importance of the event. The event would award Brazilian director Carlos Diegues for his work and will also pay tribute to the great October Revolution with the classic movie October, directed by Sergei Yes Eisenstein. Caribbean movies will be specially featured during the festival. And with that, we've come to the end of this midday news brief. For these and many other stories, you can find them on our website, tellusyourtv.net forward slash English. And join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tell Us Your English, I'm Sony Gray. Thank you so much for watching.